All right, so this week I'm going to pick up right where I left off last week, which was we're going to talk about data types. Uh, I had some people ask me some questions about Lab 3. I had a, two seconds to double check what the heck was happening in Lab 3. And it's an, ER, an ERD, so a conceptual diagram is what we want, not a physical diagram. So many to many are allowed in there. There. That covers that, answer, that question. Um, so we're going to finish off Lab, I mean, Lecture 4. I'm going to try to get Lecture 5 done today, which will bring us to right to where we're supposed to be. Um, next week will be review for the midterm, which will be the following week. So in class. So I'll give you guys at least some basic information. Uh, I'm still tweaking the, uh, the midterm, so number of questions isn't set in stone yet. Uh, but it's multiple guess or multiple question, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, it's done on the laptop in Brightspace, but you're required to be here. That's, that's it. <laughs> that's the info. Um, usually you have about an hour to do it and then you get to leave. Uh, by then you should actually have lab f uh, four done, most of lab five done also. So you'll have very little work to do the week of the midterm, which is good because I'm sure other classes are kicking the living crap out of you. So I tried to not, I tried to let you guys go into your midterm break with nothing on the plate at all for this class. So, yes. Okay. Uh, so for, without further ado, um, oh yeah, and you can ignore, somebody's going to come in and grab a pair of set of keys off the desk and leave. You can ignore her. My daughter needs my car. <laughs> so you just, she'll come in, grab the stuff and leave. Just pretend she's not even there. Okay. So. This week, um, or should have been last week, is to finish off the talk about data types. Um, so when you're talking about data types, now we're talking about physical diagramming. And in physical diagramming, um, that's where you tend to set the data types for your, da your database. And as a rule of thumb, you try to pick a data type that works with the data you're trying to store. Um, Making everything a VARCAR 255 is stupid. Uh, the data type and its restrictions should map out to what the data actually is in the real world. And we have uh, a variety of tech, uh, data types we can use to make things better or more reasonable. And for, okay, so you guys learned Python first, right? Shoot. This one's easier to explain to Java students. Because Python's like PHP, it's typeless. Unless you coerce data types. So in many programming languages, they're not variables aren't loosely typed. In other words, in Java, you define a variable as a string or as an integer or as a float. And it is enforced to be that. Uh, in database, we try to do something similar where we set certain fields to have certain kinds of data types. And the first most common data type that people get used to right off the bat is the text types. And there are three kinds. Uh, the original is car slash character. Um, it's a fixed length string. This was the original way to store data of a you know, text-like format in the database. Um, it was really important that actually they used this type back in the day because when storage media was slow, the software needed to know t literally how far to move the head or how far to move the tape or as applicable. Um, so a car field is a set length field and it always occupies that length. So if you define something as a character 10 or a car 10, it will always use, assuming you know, a Latinate language, 10 bytes of data. Even if you put in just the letter A, it's still going to occupy 10 bytes. It all, always occupies the exact same length of space. Uh, way back in the day, that meant database calls really, really fast because the computers knew where to jump to keep going through these because it always knew exactly how long to read and all that stuff. However, that occupies room. And if you think back a little bit and then try to put yourself in your parents' shoes when we had computers where, um, you know, 10 seconds of video nowadays is occupies 10 times the amount of space our original hard drives had. We had to find a way to make that be not so fat. So they came up with something called uh, character varying or VARCAR. 
the, depending on the database engine, Varkar may have different names. Um, Varkar you can find in uh, Microsoft SQL Server, MySQL, and Postgres. Uh, Oracle decides to be the special child and it calls it Varkar 2. Because Varkar is reserved for future use. I don't know. Um, so what Varkar is, is you define a specific length of string. So you can say, oh, this Varkar will occupy up to, will allow you to put in up to 10 things. But it will only occupy the length of the string plus uh, a couple of bits, not a byte, a couple of bits. So there's like a marker that says, oh, this field ends here, stop reading, you can go to the next thing now. Uh, so that saves a lot of disk space. If you just put in the letter A and something that can take up to 255 characters, you're only going to occupy, you know, one byte plus that little bit of space. Uh, historically, plain card fields were significantly faster. Um, most database engines now have improved to the point where there is no difference. So, unless you are storing one single character, which happens, you should just use a var car. Uh, now, if you need more space, because different database engines have different limits for varcar. Um, MySQL tends to want to tap out at 255 characters for a varcar. Um, I think recently they updated, updated to 1,000. Um, other database servers such as Postgres will let you up to, put, I think it's five or 6,000 characters in a varcar. Uh, but if you need more than that, um, you'd use a text type field. Um, in Postgres it's called text in Microsoft products, it's called memo. Uh, in Oracle, it's called clob, character large object, because Oracle's special, again. Um, MySQL is kind of stupid. Uh, it has three. Instead of just having one that is universally used, they have three. Small text, text, big text. Uh, small text will hold up to, uh, if I remember right, um, one, no, 50K of text. A regular text field will hold up to, uh, I think it's 500K, and then the large text basically doesn't have a limit. It has a limit, but it's more like the limit of the OS. Um, so with MySQL, you know, you have to think about the data that's gonna go in and pick the right one. But text is used for large free form data where you don't know how much they're going to type in. They're going to type in an essay, they're going to insert an entire encyclopedia. That goes into text. All right, we have numbers. And as always, um, there's integers, numerics, floats, and bits. Um, so integers, depending on the database engine, they're defined differently, but they can usually be qualified usually as a small int, an int, and a big int. Those are the three normal ones you find everywhere. Um, again, the different database engine will have different limitations on what each of those mean. I know, for example, big int in a Postgres server will, will give you a number that's uh, a 27 digits long, a 27 digit integer. That gives you an idea of how big a number that is. There's like areas in there, I don't know what they're called. I mean, once you get past like, you know, the quadrillions, that starts changing names. Um, MySQL does something a little different. It actually has a sized integer, so you can tell an integer and how many, how much precision. Uh, integers are whole numbers. That means there's no decimal places. That's, you know, hopefully you guys know what integers are, being in a computer science type program. Um, different database engines also allow um, having a signed or unsigned. In other words, does it allow negatives or not? Uh, for example, Postgres, there's no such thing as unsigned. All integers have a sign. Uh, in MySQL, on the other hand, you can define a, an integer as being unsigned so that you can fit one more digit by removing the sign. So if you go integer eight, it'll hold eight numbers but if you say, sorry, if you do integer eight, it'll hold seven numbers plus, an, uh, plus the negative sign. If you do unsigned, it'll let you hold eight. It actually reserves like one whole byte for the negative sign. It's kind of special that way. 
Um, decimal and numerics, depending on the database engine, they do the same thing. Decimal is interesting. Um, it's what most database engines will use for money. Like a lot of them will provide a money type or a currency type where, you know, number, decimal, some amount of precision. Uh, but because they're not compatible in all database engines, most people that design for things that hold money will use either dec decimal numeric, they're interchangeable. They mean the same thing. And the way it works is that it reserves amount of space. So if I were to do, and I hope my marker survives, if I did a Let's go five comma two. So for those that can't read that, that says numeric five comma two. What this does is it allows us to store a nine digit number with two of those digits reserved for the decimal place. So five digits with two reserved for the decimal place. That's what numeric does. Uh, most accounting systems will do comma three because realistically for accounting you want to keep three digits so that would be six two would let you do 999 and 0.999. Um, numerics are cool, they'll round automatically for you. So if you put something with more decimal places, it'll round it to the appropriate one so you don't need to think about rounding. Uh, human beings suck at rounding as a rule of thumb. Um, now the next one is a float and double. Um, float and double is basically a floating point uh, number. In other words, a number with a decimal place and there's basically no limit on the number of decimals and it's after a while it just gets expressed using mathematical equation or notation. Um, and again, depending on the database server, there's different limits. Uh, bit. Bit means it's on or off. Well, actually, it's not quite true. Uh, well, yeah, it's close enough. Bit means it's on or off. But it's not used for Booleans. It's on or off. Um, now we've got about uh, date and timestamps. Um, so we've got date, date, time, I think that's self-explanatory. A date holds a date. Date time holds date and time. Again, depending on the database server, uh, date time may have um, different amount of precision. Uh, one of the reasons, for example, Postgres is really popular in the scientific community is that it's accurate to five digits of precision below a second. So hundredth of a second, thousandth of a second, ten thousandths of a second, hundred thousandths of a second, I guess a millionth of a second, a millisecond. It's accurate to. Uh, that's what you can store time in that database server. Uh, MySQL, not so much. If I remember it, MySQL goes to two places of precision. Um, Timestamp. It's a special version of date time that respects the time zone. Uh, also, if you use it in MySQL, it automatically sets it every time you touch the record. So you create the record, updates whatever field is set as timestamp. You update the record, timestamp field gets populated with the new timestamp. It's automatically populating in MySQL. Um, other database servers, no. Because it's kind of a, just a weird MySQL behavior. Uh, there's also time and year. Time is self-explanatory store in a time. Uh, year, same thing, just the year. Uh, uh, depending on the database server you're looking at, um, there are others that are kind of cool. Um, I'm sure MySQL has picked up some of these over the years since these slides were made. Uh, one of the nifty ones is Interval. Um, I know Oracle has it, Postgres has it, Microsoft SQL Server has it, so I'm surprised MySQL does not, would not. Uh, interval measures how long something took. If you don't care when it started or when it ended, you just care about how long it took, that's what an interval is for. Fantastic for the scientific community. If you're just storing thousands of test results, you only care about how long the test ran for, you don't care what time this test, test started or ended, 
just how long it took to run. That's what intervals are for. Um, so there's one data type that is missing in here. You might have noticed or not. Anybody want to take a guess which data type was missed on any of these slides? That's actually pretty common in computing. Then I'll explain to you why MySQL is extra stupid. Booleans. You guys should know what a Boolean is by now, right? True, false, one, zero. MySQL does not have a true Boolean data type. What does it do? It uses a tiny int one. A tiny int one stores one number and only one number. And you make it unsigned, obviously. That means that MySQL not only has yes, actually, sorry, most Booleans have three settings, right, in a database. Yes, no, and unknown, also known as null. So if you use Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, Oracle, that all support true Booleans. If you allow a Boolean to be null, each Boolean has three modes. Yes, no, and I don't know. It's like asking your SO, do you want Mexican for supper? Yes, no, or I don't know, you pick. It's the same idea. With MySQL, on the other hand, we have I don't know, and then zero through nine of options of maybe. Um, obviously, p everybody uses null, zero, and one, and everything else is ignored. But the fact is that we have to dedicate an entire byte for yes or no, when it can just be done as a nullable bit, like most other database servers. Um, so whenever you have to do a Boolean, congratulations, you're using an integer instead. All right, so how do you choose your data types? Um, there's a few things you have to do. How big is the data? So you look at the data and you try to choose a data type that is appropriate. For example, would you store a phone number into an integer? Let's think about that for a second. Okay, we're gonna put the, the phone number into an integer, but now you need to search for the last four digits of the phone number. How are you gonna do that in an integer? Because they're numbers. You can't search for the last four digits of a number. You can search for the last four characters of a string. So that means for a phone number, you'd use a varcar. Would you make it a varcar 255 or maybe varcar 15, varcar 20, just to limit how long it is? Um, so that's some of what you think about when you're picking out your data type. Is it big? What kind of data goes into it? Uh, is it numeric? In other words, is it a number? Do we need to worry about decimal places? If it's a number and you don't need to worry about decimal places, use an integer. Integers take up less room than a number that has decimal places. Even if the number doesn't have actually any decimal places, it's still reserving space for the decimal place in the system. And a search via SQL again in, against an integer is significantly faster than against a float. So when you pick your data type, you gotta think about, am I ever gonna have decimal places or not? If the answer is no, use an integer. If it's yes, then you have to decide if it's you know two places of precision, three places of precision, or you don't know how much precision you're gonna need, so that's gonna be the decision between a numeric slash decimal or a float or a double. Uh, if it's a date, you'll notice here, I'm not putting a question on that. If it's a date, you should include the time. I'll use the date time. Whenever there's a date, Always include date time. Unless it's like one of those really odd cases where you know for a fact you'll never need to know the time. A good one is a person's date of birth. You don't need to know the time a person was born. The only place that needs to, that cares is the hospital. I don't think I've ever seen anywhere else in the world that's ever asked, what time were you born? I could tell you I don't know. I know it was a Friday, supposedly. Um, but yeah, if it's a date, you should always include the time. And here's the logic why. A date time field occupies a tiny little bit more room than a date field. However, if you are doing database entries and suddenly somebody says, hey, how many transactions did we have between 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. yesterday? If you're just searching on the date, you have no way to know. If you have the time, you can search for it. 
You can always filter out the time when you're actually running a query or doing a report because you can cast the data as a date. It'll strip off the time. But you cannot manufacture data. So it's better to capture a little extra data by capturing the date time, like the whole timestamp, as opposed to suddenly needing more precision and not having it. So if it's a date, always include the time unless it's one of those very rare things where you, must, it, you will never know what time something happened at. What time, when was an order placed? Always include the timestamp. When was an order shipped? Always include the timestamp. Um, when did a student complete their test? Always include the time and the date. When was someone born? That's just going to be the date because most people don't know what time they were born at. So that's the logic behind dates. Um, if it's text, how big is it? Especially when you're dealing with MySQL, because you want to have store as much, you know, want to have enough room in text to hold it. And the last one says, just say no to blobs. Blobs are binary large objects. Different database servers handle them differently. Um, essentially, a binary large object would be a JPEG, an MP3, a Word document. Well, the old Word document format, the new one's XML. Um, anything that contains binary data. Um, uh, there's a really good reason for that. How big are the pictures that your phones take? Actually, I haven't checked on my new phone how big the pictures are, but I know my old phone, they were about four megabytes a picture. That doesn't sound very big. Considering, you know, installing the parking app for the school is, uh, what was it, like a 46 megabyte download just for Hawk Mobile, just so you can pay for parking. People think, yeah, three megabytes, it's not that big. Okay, let's go put that three megabytes into a database 10,000 times. Now your database is, you know, looks like it spent the weekend at an all-you-can-eat buffet. It's fat. So backing up something that's fat is really difficult. Why? Because it takes a long time. If the database server crashes, you might lose data because the tables are so big that they can corrupt themselves. Therefore, you don't store blobs in the database. You store them on disk and you just use a var card with the file name of where this is stored. Database is much smaller. You can back up the files using standard file system backup software. Everybody's happy. I've, in my career, in 26 years, I have seen the use for blobs one time. I was storing international characters in a table that didn't support them. Database was defined as Latin 1. For those of you that don't know what that means, it means it holds the English slash French slash, you know, Italian, Portuguese, and, uh, you know, Spanish alphabets, essentially. Uh, German might be held in there, too. But the second you start talking about anything outside of that, the data gets eaten. Swedish comes out like gobbledygook. Asian languages guaranteed comes out nothing like it looked like coming in on the other side. So we used blob so we could store the string in its native binary format. In other words, instead of actually storing letter A, we'd store the character code for the letter A into that field because we're storing it binary so there's no thunking happening to the characters. That's the only purpose you should ever use blobs for. It's also good for holding XML because XML is a little weird. Okay, so that's the talk about data types. Now you get to hear my rant about natural keys versus synthetic keys. So, as a quick reminder, since it's been you know a little bit since we talked about keys, a composite key is a key that's made of two or more attributes that we should know by now. A natural key is a key that's formed from one or more attributes of data that exists in the real world. An example would be a social security number or a SIN number in Canada, your passport number, visa number, credit card number. Those are all natural keys that could be used as an identifier. 
A synthetic key, also known as a surrogate key, depending on which textbook you've read and which profs you've had. Uh, I've heard it called both ways, so you know I'm going to put both on the slide. It's a key that has no business meaning. In other words, it's a piece of data that's completely fab fabricated when a record is created. That number has no meaning outside of the database, unless you know you do something special. And you guys are all victims of something special here at Algonquin. Your student number is a synthetic key. When your records get put, in, gets put into the system, you're given a number automatically that has no meaning outside the system. And then they go, hey, by the way, tr remember this whatever, how long, 10-digit number. You'll need it for the next three years, five years, six months, to three weeks, depending on how well your college career goes. So your student number is a synthetic key. A primary key is the preferred key for an entity. And a foreign key, you guys know, that's a key that derives its value from a primary key elsewhere to connect two tables. Now we got the definitions out of the way. I'm going to talk about some of the issues with natural keys. Um, surrogate keys, primary keys that use natural data have size issues. If you store a person's SIN number, you're actually going to be end up using a characters, not a number, because you need to be able to search in it. That means that no matter what, you're going to be always occupying, like in Canada, SIN, uh, SIN is nine characters long, so you're going to always occupy nine bytes. <coughs> if you're actually using a synthetic key, the number is actually small because for each byte you can hold eight numbers, right? So you can count to 30, 32 on one hand if you know how. It's a magic trick, you know? And every time you add a finger, this is 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024 on 10 fingers. That's uh, it's an interesting trick. So in a, a byte can hold a lot of numbers. And every time you just add another byte, you're literally doubling how many numbers it can hold. So we're get keys, because they're magical, automatically generated numbers, they tend to be a little bit skinnier. Um, foreign key size, well, if the primary key is fat, the foreign key is going to be fat too. That means you're making that table even fatter. So if you've got to use eight bytes to hold a key, great. Uh, aesthetics, some people think that a natural key looks nicer. Um, honestly, I find synthetic keys look a bit better. Uh, they're definitely uh, makes your code a little simpler and not as complicated. Um, optionality and applicability. Surrogate keys don't have a problem with people or things not wanting or being able to provide the data. For example, you go up to a database system and you are an international student. That means you may or may not, well, you probably guarantee not have a SIN number, Canadian social insurance number. You have some other number. And their system insists it must be a SIN number. You don't have one. How do you get put into the system? I don't know. You're not going into the system if you can't provide the information it needs for a natural key. On the other hand, if it's a synthetic key, you can say, well, I guess they don't have that information next and just keep populating the rest because it'll give you a number on its own. Um, uniqueness, natural keys, not guaranteed to be unique. Um, this is a problem Algonquin had years ago. And actually, my college I went to also had this problem. A lot of the old uh, student information systems didn't take international students into account when they were first created. Some people think, well, that doesn't sound that bad. Um, until the one day where they were putting in the unique identifier for an, uh, an international student, and their unique identifier, which happened to be a passport number, was exactly the same as another student's SIN number. Well, you can't have two values in a primary key that are the same. So suddenly they start having this conflict where, you know, you couldn't put the two things in. All the schools, you know, had a bit of a head scratch and had to redesign some of their databases around this. Uh, it was an interesting experience for everybody involved. 
Uh, privacy. Synthetic keys don't have a privacy issue. Imagine you're using somebody's social insurance number, SSN number, passport number as your primary key, and then, you know, the person at reception has your record up on screen, SIN number is completely visible to the world, and there's somebody else sitting about five feet back with, you know, their phone zoomed in taking pictures of everybody's SIN numbers. Man, I remember the day that wasn't even a concern. Just people had really good memories you had to worry about. So, again, synthetic keys don't care about privacy because they have no real world meaning. Uh, accidental denormalization, you can't denormalize stuff that's synthetic because it's synthetic. Uh, cascading updates, somebody's SIN number changes. That means you've got to change any child record that depends on it. How are you going to update a child record when the parent record no longer has the right number, but it won't let you change the parent number when the child num number is there, chicken before the egg, right? You can't mess with the child records unless you've changed the parent record, and you can't change the parent record because it's got child records. Synthetic keys are fine because, you know, they have no real world meaning, so they get carried forward. Um, and when I say somebody's SIN number change, I mean, every once in a while, somebody gets their identity compromised, then you need to get a new SIN number. It's because your SIN number is now floating around in some bad person's inventory of ways to steal your identity. Such as life. Um, Varkar join speeds. Join, doing joins across characters is slow. Integers are fast. Why? Because computers are really good at playing with numbers, not so good playing with letters. Imagine if I was doing a join and not only does it have to check A to Z, 0 to 1, it also has to check the entire Swedish alphabet, all the Cyrillic alphabet, and decides to throw in, you know, both versions of Chinese, the three versions of Japanese, the two versions of Korean, and it needs to go character by character through each of those alphabet sets while it's doing joins. On the other hand, it goes, give me everything where 4 is equal to 4. The Varkar join speeds are a terrible thing. So some people say synthetic keys have uh, disadvantages. And honestly, there's only two. And out of those two, really neither of them are a real issue. Uh, the first one is saying, hey, getting the next value. In other words, what's the next number? Almost all database servers have some auto-incrementing method. The only one, and I might be lying now because I haven't used it in years for this, is Oracle. You'd think Oracle would have it, but it has it, but not quite. Uh, MySQL has uh, a modifier called uh, auto-increment. Postgres has two types of data types. There's serial, and then there's also uh, a special a special property, you can call it an identifying column, which automatically does a number. Microsoft SQL Server has something else, called, I don't remember what it's called. Oracle has it, but you actually got to program it in. You actually have to write a trigger that sets the next value. It has a sequence, like a clicker, one, two, three, four, but you have to say on insert, grab the next value of the sequence. Poop, and then it go, off it goes. Um, out of all of them, for once, I'll say MySQL probably does it the nicest. I don't give MySQL compliments very often, but I think MySQL probably does it the nicest. Uh, once Postgres, now that Postgres has identity type columns, that's a close second. But MySQL was the first one to have the really nice way of doing this. Um, the other complaint people have is there's extra indexes, because indexes take up room. And if you have n number of indexes, if especially if you're using natural keys. In other words, uh, you're going to index on somebody's social security number, their email, and their phone number. So your table has three indexes, right? And they say, well, if you use a synthetic key, you're going to have to have a fourth index because the primary key also always has an index. So that means you have to have the primary keys index and the other three. Way back in the day, when hard drives are measured in megabytes, not gigabytes or terabytes, it really made a difference. Nowadays, that you know, primary key index might be occupying 100K, 200K of the table, of the disk. That's nothing. That's smaller than half the Word documents that people write. So even though people say these are disadvantages, they're not really disadvantages. They're just things that old school database designers like to complain about. 
Don't be an old school database designer. Be modern. Okay, that takes care of where I was supposed to be last week. Oh, good. PowerPoint didn't have an unhappy day. And like this. Five, five, five. Which is kind of funny because I was just talking about indexes, and our next topic is indexes. Okay. So let's pretend now that the bad windstorm never happened and we're exactly where we're supposed to be this week. We're just starting class uh, 39 minutes late. Shoot, I didn't want to go that long on that last topic. Okay. How is it a problem or not a problem? It, no, no, it's just that old school database designers complain that auto increment is a old, old, the old school database engines didn't have auto increment. It's, that's what I'm saying. These are things that people complain about being an issue that really are no longer an issue. Auto increment's an amazing thing. All database servers basically support it in one way or another. Just some of them is, requires an extra step like Oracle. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server does, does numbers and it also does... Um, uh, uh, GUIDs, GUIDs, globally unique IDs. So they're 32 alpha, literally a 32 character long hex number. So you know when if ever you opened up the registry in your PC and you look at, no, you're not running a Mac. So you open up a registry on your PC and you'll see like these really long strings that are just hex, 8F, 0 to 9. That's GUIDs. Okay. Okay, right, so indexes and views, which is actually kind of a good segue because I was just talking about, you know, n number of indexes taking up space. So I'm going to talk about indexes and views, time permitting. We'll do the whole thing. Otherwise, I'll pick up the views next week. Um, I'd rather not, so you guys can actually go into Lab 5, not blind. Um, so I'm going to talk about what indexes are for, how you define them, uh, the types of indexes, their rules, uh, a couple of quick dirty, dirty examples of SQL. I'll talk about views, the types of views, how they work, and uh, some examples also. Okay, so indexes. So most queries don't retrieve the entire contents of a table or the contents of multiple tables. Normally you try to only pull what you need Therefore, we need to search through the data. And if the only way to get information out of the database is if you had to go through the entire thing, record by record, it's really inefficient. Um, so here's the example of how that is. You go select star from table A. Table A has 100,000 records. And the way it's going to go is record one. Is the name equal to Dan? No. Record two, is the name equal to Dan? No. Record three, is the name equal to Dan? Yes. Okay. We're going to pull out three. Four, no. Five, no. 100,000 times. We all know computers can do 100,000 operations really, really fast. On the other hand, now there's 300 people asking through that 100,000 rows of data. Things are going to get a little slow at that point because the computer can only do that one at a time. So each person has to wait for the next person to finish, you end up with this big lag. So that is terrible. So what indexes do is they let us speed up the search so that it doesn't search the entire database. It's very similar as the index at the end of a textbook. You know, you're trying to find a certain topic in the book and you flip open the back of the book and you go look in the indexes and you go, oh, there's the command for uh, Python to, you know, print a character a certain way. And then it says you'll find this on page, you know, 53, 56, and 92. So that means, you you know, you open page 53. No, that's not it. 56, no, 92 is the one I needed. Indexes do something similar. It tells the database engine where records are stored on the disk. So when it starts searching, it knows to only go to certain places on the disk. It doesn't need to search the entire table. It only searches a subset of the table. 
Okay, well, I just used that example. I got ahead of myself by one slide. Um, so there is a definition of what an index is. It's a data structure that's used to speed up data retrieval. And usually if there's keys and other commonly searched fields in a customer database that could be phone number, email, postal code, person's name probably would be common search criteria. And uh, these structures are invisible, as in you can't do select star from whatever index. It's metadata. So it's data that's hidden behind the scenes to allow you to search. So indexes, so primary keys are always indexed automatically. Uh, you don't get to say no, because why would you not index your primary key? It's kind of pointless. Um, and combination of fields, one or other more fields, are also known as non-unique keys. Um, there could be also known as secondary keys. Uh, they're basically used for also for indexes. S those would be used as, um, as I use the example, a person's phone number, email address, postal code, you know, other things you'd search on. So most database servers default to what they call a B plus tree. And the way it works is take the data, divide it in half, divide it again in half until you got four layers of data. So if I were, for example, if I were going to use this group as an example, I'd go everybody whose last name starts with A to M, left side of the room, N, right side of the N to Z, go to the right side of the room. Good. Now, left side of the room. A to D, first row, E to F, second row, G to it, whatever K, then, you know, L, M at the back. On the other side, I could divide it like that again. Then in theory, I could go even further than that till I'd get to the point where everybody's divided into very small chunks. And with names, if the database gets big enough, you'll have a lot of common names, but they'll all be grouped together. So when you go and search through an index, it will dig through the index saying, hey, we're trying to find somebody whose last name starts with S, oh, this half. Okay, now in this half, S is the third row from the back. And so then we go, okay, now we're going to look for somebody whose name is SA. Then it'll look, you know, the ones that are SA in that group. And then maybe instead of searching a million rows, you'd search 5,000 rows. So it, that's what indexes do. It divides them and it basically puts coordinates on where things are stored. And, uh, well, that's literally the example I just used, but using... Uh, a chart. So the first part here, you've got everything starting with before F. So then you have B, D, and F. So everything before B would be A, B, and then D and F, and then P. So between F and P would be down in this block. So anything that starts H, L, and P, they'd be divided into more chunks and vice versa. And that's literally how an index works on the inside. I'll be completely honest. I use indexes, but I don't actually think about what they're doing. I'm just happy they work. Uh, there's some people with really fancy pocket protectors that are way smarter than I am that have figured this stuff out, how to make it happen, like magic on the inside. But essentially, the whole thing is it takes the data, divides it in half, divides it in half, divides it in half, and divides it in half. It's a, literally, it's the same idea as when you play a guessing game, right? Guess a number between 1 and 10. What should always be your first guess? Five. The person has to say higher or lower. So then if they say lower, your next guess is three. Then if you've got three and five, and it says, well, it's higher than three, that's going to be four. You got it in three guesses. And even with 100 numbers, you can usually do it in five guesses or less because of that, by dividing it. That's the same idea. Now, um, 
the hashed file organization is a weird one. Um, Essentially, it hashes the value of the record and then groups based on parts of the hashes that match. So they are used for lookup lists, and they're really, really fast for lookup lists and pretty much nothing else. Um, so it figures out where it is in the table using a uh, hash. So you search for flyers. You hash it. For those of you guys that don't know what a hash is, it's a... Um, a way of getting a fingerprint of the data. A really popular one historically was MD5. So you give it MD5 because you back, I don't remember what it is, 12 characters, 16 characters long of alphanumeric. And the way it works is it'll go, it takes the data, it hashes it, then it looks through the hash list for the matching information and goes from that. And it's really good for smaller subsets of data that you often have to pull up. So when you're creating a unique index, usually a primary key, um, the line is like that line, that first line of SQL, create unique index, give it a name on table name, and then the field. Uh, Non-unique indexes are usually done for stuff like zip codes and product categories. Again, create index, give it a name on table, brackets, parentheses, I mean, field name, um, that's all there is to it. You issue the command, it grinds for a little while, and suddenly your queries are faster. So the rules for using indexes, you tend to want to use them on larger tables. Uh, tables with, actually I'll get to that one at, at five. So index, the primary key always gets indexed. You don't get to argue about it. That always happens. So. Do you want to index search fields? Uh, these are fields that are frequently used in the WHERE clause. You know, select star from customer where phone number equals 613-555-1212. You would index phone number because you search on that often. Uh, email address is another one that get in, gets indexed in most database systems because people search for email addresses. Uh, anything you'd include in an order by or a group by clause, why? It speeds up the math. So normally, you want to use indexes when there are over 100 values, uh, but rarely when you have less than 100. Um, I didn't write the slide and never understood why they mag used the magic 100, the number 100 and the number 30. But essentially the rule is if there's more than 100 values, index, if there's less than 100 values, there's no point. Unless, of course, you're going to be doing tons of joins against it then maybe it's going to make a point, but realistically, no. So avoid indexes for fields that have really long values. You don't want to index a text field that contains, you know, an entire medical report. It's really hard to index. It's, you're not going to get any performance improvements from it. Um, When they say compress the values first, there's all kinds of techniques people use to compress the values. And I don't talk, I don't mean like zip it or, you know, or tar or any of that kind of stuff. I'm talking about if you've got a big block of text, you get rid of all the common words out of it. You should only ever have the, the words people would search for. That would mean you get rid of like I, the, in, at, they. Get rid of the pronouns, get rid of the conjugative words, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, if a key to index is used to determine le re location of a record, try to use uh, surrogate keys. Why? Because it'll do two things. The keys are going to be smaller and it's going to spread the records more evenly across um, the storage area. So if you've got numbers 1 to 10,000, you can divide that in half easy. Take that, divide in half easy. On the other hand, if you're used, you're keying off somebody's last name, and you happen to be in a country where half the country all has the same last name, Vietnam, I'm looking at you, it's, uh, you'll end up with a lot of people in one half 
of the index and the other half will be sparsely populated. So you have to do some decision making skills there. Um, database servers used to have limits on how many indexes were allowed per table. Not so common anymore. Um, and there's also a limit of how many bytes per index. Not really a problem anymore. This is going way back, old database servers. Um, I recommend against indexing things that can be null because when you search and if there's nulls and you're searching for a specific string, it will actually exclude records that are null so they'll never even be searched. It's as if the null records do not even exist. So be careful when you index stuff that might have nulls because the nulls, A, don't get indexed, and they will be skipped as part of the search. It's not great. So when you go to create an index, when I go to create an index, you use the format as follows. Create index, give it a name, on. Then it's the name of the table, and then the field or fields, because you can index more than one field that are being indexed. So in this case, it's create index, name index, on person name. Yeah? No. No, the data type matters in the sense of how it's going to organize the data. But for creating the index, it doesn't make a difference. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. No, data type, the database server takes care of the data type. You don't have to worry about. Um, Depending on the database engine you're using, like Postgres or Oracle or whatever, they actually offer more than one kind of index type, like uh, which algorithm it uses to figure out the index. And then there, your data may make it, the data may make a difference. So you, depending on what you're indexing, you might want to choose a different indexing algorithm. MySQL, not so much. It has one. <coughs> Mind you, it uses the, most, the one that's applicable in 98% of the time, so you know, you're fine. You're going to even mix match strings and integers in the same, in, same in index. So if you were doing a multi-column index, which you can, you could mix match strings and integers and it would be fine. It doesn't care. And here's an example of a multi-column one with different data types. So create index and you know, creatively name double index on person. Then we're going to index the age and the city. So what's kind of weird about indexes is, is if you do an index of this nature and you go select star from person where age is 55 and the city is equal to Seattle, that index will help with that query. But it won't help if you just looked for people in the city of Seattle. And here's why. So when you issue a command to the database server, so in a piece of SQL, it does what happens is there's something called a query optimizer. So it reads your query, looks at the structure of the database, and tries to find the best way to retrieve the data. So it, it finds, it optimizes the, the search pattern for the query. And if it sees that you have an index, so if you're doing an aware where there's multiple columns included, such as age and city, it'll try to find an index that matches those two columns. On the other hand, if you only have one column in your where clause, however, you created an index and it's only an index on two columns, it'll say, hey, you don't have any single column indexes where CD is involved, I can't use the index. So often what happens is people will often create multiple indexes on a table with a combination of columns in it single column indexes for the most commonly used fields, and then maybe a combination of things so that maybe you search for a person's last name and phone number. That's maybe that's something people search on a regular basis. Then, you know, you might create a key with that, com with that combination of columns too. There's, it's quite challenging to find the best way to write a query. This is where, remember I was talking about uh, sample data, I think it was last week where you want to load the database up with a lot of data and then you start running your queries against it and to identify which ones run slow. And then you create queries to match out to the ones that run slow.
And indexes are good for range queries. Why? Because obviously if you're looking for a range of numbers and that range of numbers is inside of a inside of an index, it's only going to find those that match and give you those records. So in this case, it's again creating an index on a person's age and it'll help for um, a range of 25 to 28, which as you can see, we now actually have a question right on the slide because that used to be a very common question at this point. So why wouldn't you index all the things? Yes, that's one of the reasons. There's a couple of reasons. Indexes take up space. They don't take up huge amounts of space, but they take up space. And if you're talking about a table that has a million rows of data, for you guys, you know, you've played with databases that have, you know, a couple hundred rows of data. You've, the whole concept of a million rows of data is really hard to wrap your head around. But let's just say for every index in that million rows of data, it occupies 500K. So the table itself might be occupying 20 megabytes, 500K. So you decide to index every column individually. The table has 25 columns. So now you're going to go 500K times 25. Now your indexes are actually occupying more room than the actual table itself. And then you start creating some compound keys and those ones are even larger so they might be 750K or a megabyte an index. So now you're sitting there creating indexes and you know the table itself is now because of the indexes and the metadata and the table and everything is now occupying say 100 megabytes. It's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That's one of the reasons why you don't want to do that. The other reason is the query optimizer will get confused. It'll go, oh, there's a, an index that does this. Oh, but there's another index that does this and this. Oh, but there's another index that does half of this one and a bit of this one, but not that one. And the query optimizer after a while goes, I don't know which one you're going to have to use, so I'm not going to use any. So if you have too many indexes, the data query optimizer gets confused. It decides to do the smart thing and do a table scan instead. Row one is the name equal to Dan. Row two is the name equal to Dan. Instead of looking at the back of the book and looking where Dan's located in the database. Um, that's why you don't index all the things. Y yes. Um, so if you have a query where you go where age is equal to 55 and name is or city is equal to Seattle, but you only have the city indexed, it will look through the available indexes and say, well, I got an index that matches part of this, so I'm going to use it. If you have two individual indexes that has age and Seattle, it will use them both, but it won't be as efficient as if you had a compound index that had both in it, but it will use both. So what it will do is it will scan index for Seattle, it'll scan the index for 55, and then it'll look at what records match out. So you know, it does one scan, does another scan, looks what matches, and says, okay, this block is what matches between the two. That's what I'm going to retrieve. Whereas with the other one, it'll literally search both columns at the same time, so it does a single index scan. On the other hand, if you don't have um, an index at all, it does a complete table scan. Small table doesn't make a difference. Big table makes a huge difference. No problem. Don't mind me, I just want to make sure my parking hasn't expired. I paid for parking so my daughter could use my car and she hasn't got the keys yet. Hee <laughs> hee. Mm. Oh, look at that. Uh, yep, yeah, I'm parked out there. Uh, that's good. I don't have to pay for my extra parking. All right. Now we're going to talk about views. So indexes is a complicated topic, and depending on how much you want to get in indexes before I continue talking, continue talking about views, um, literally in universities, so if you're specializing in database topics in computer sciences in university, uh, they can actually have almost an entire term just on the topic of indexes. Just so you know. But those are the people that actually, you know, 
do um, what they call relational mathematics. So did you know there's an actual entire field of math dedicated to how to store data? Um, if I remember, I'll bring one of my really old textbooks that has it, and I'll, I'll show it to you guys next week. It makes me want to cry. There's all kinds of symbols in there that I've never seen except for there. And it's all one man that invented the entire thing. So, you know, guy was brilliant. Uh, C.J. Date, Christopher Date from IBM in the 70s, 60s, came up with this math. And they learned this math to learn how to do indexes. It's really cool. Really complicated. Um, I've never needed to know any of it in my entire 26 year career. So just saying, you know, indexes are important to know. You just need to know how to use them more than how they work on the inside. Okay, so views. Views are kind of nifty. So views are database objects, relations, people call tables relations, um, except they are not physically, uh, they don't exist physically. So it allows you to create a query. You write a query, and often it'll be a pretty complicated query. And for future use, you don't want to have to keep rewriting this query. So you can save the definition of that query in the database. So, as you can see in the example here, we have select name and project from employee where department's equal to development. So, if you were to run that query, it would execute the query and give you results. Let's say you want to save it for future use so you don't have to remember that query, or you maybe you have an application that runs reports and you defined reports creating views. You can actually use syntax, create view, you give it a name as, and then the select statement. And my computer prof. My database prof in college would hate me when I say this now, but think of it as a bookmark. Now, everybody in here knows what a bookmark is. When I went to school, you know, NCSA Mosaic 1.0 had just come out when I was going through college. So the internet was, the internet as we know it was, you know, only a year too old. Um, man, that makes me feel old when I say that. And so back then, concept bookmarks really wasn't something everybody understood. Nowadays, everybody knows what a bookmark is. Basically, you take a long URL, give it a nice short name, shove it in your favorites. You never need to remember the big long URL because you just go, oh, I want to go read world news on Reddit today. Pop, right? And you just click on the shortcut and you know where you're going. So what this view will do is um, you can use the view to filter out what people can see. There is a, a lot of purposes for a view. And there's not a lot of slides on what's left in here. So, so one of the common uses for views is to hide sensitive information from different people. Depending on how your application is written, um, the views will change based on the person's role. So that somebody goes and tries to retrieve data from the database they go, oh, I want this record, and it'll use the view to pull up the record, and it might exclude certain columns, like a person's SIN number. Uh, people in payroll and HR may need the entire employee record. However, people that work in um, the development department only needs to know a person's name and what projects they're working on. So you can use a view to filter out what people see. Um, so when you create a view in MySQL, the syntax is to create the view, give it a name as, and then your standard run-of-the-mill select statement, as simple or as complicated as you want it to be. These kinds of views are known as dynamic views. That means none of the data is ever store, stored. Every time you run it, it runs immediately. Um, that means it's, not, it's never any faster than a regular query. It's never going to be out of date. It's just there as a way of shortening complicated queries. So here's a slightly different view. Um, create view, Seattle view as, select buyer, seller, product store from person, join purchase on, you know, there's the join. 
uh, and there's actually a typo in that join, uh, where the person city is equal to Seattle. So this is literally pulling out what was bought from what store in the city of Seattle. And what it'll do is it creates basically what's called a virtual table. It'll, it looks like a table, it smells like a table, it moves like a table, but it's not a table. You can use it in a join, you can use it, you know, for a bunch of things. Uh, there are limitations, which I will talk about towards the end. Um, but for us, for all intents and purposes, it looks just like a table. You go select star from Seattle view, enter, it'll run this query. Magic happens. And what's kind of cool is we can also use it in a join. So previous slide, I created a view called Seattle view. And by the way, this is using like the world's oldest join syntax. I don't know what kind of version of joins you guys learned while you were last term. So this is like the old school version 1.0 joins back in the Oracle days. Every, every database engine supports these. They're not fantastic, just so you know. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. So you select name, comma store from Seattle, comma, Seattle view, comma product, where the product matches the product's name and the product category is shoes and it'll give you the list of all the stores and the names of whoever bought those products. So you can use a view and a join, that's fine. Uh, there is, this is where though, where some of the performance issues happen. The view does not have indexes of its own. It relies on the indexes of what's contained inside of it. So if you're gonna be doing a join across something that's not indexed in the originating tables, it's gonna be doing table scans. So what happens when we query view? So a view is not a real table. It doesn't contain any data. It actually runs the original query, reading the original tables, captures the data, and then retrieves it. Uh, if the data needs to be modified and updated, you have to do it at the table level, not at part of the view. So that means you actually have to do insert updates against the table, not against the view. Uh, theoretically, there are ways to make it happen, but it's really painful and unpleasant. It actually often defeats the point of the view. Um, so insert and updates, you don't do it against the view. You do it against the, the source table. The views will reflect those changes immediately. So it's just kind of a weird roundabout way of doing it. So if I were to take that original query the Seattle view, and then I did the one with the join. What it'll do is it'll take the original view and then build it up with the new join and actually create a, jo a query that looks like this. So it takes one qu query, looks at what would be joined, magically figures out how it all interconnects and builds a new query and runs that. It's kind of cool the way it happens on the inside. There's a lot of magic that happens in there. It's good magic, but it's kind of magical because you really don't know what it's doing. Uh, but yeah, it takes the original view, adds in the match, match, matching joins, the matching wares, and gives you the results. So there are two kinds of views. The, so far I've been talking about dynamic views, also known as virtual views or virtual tables. They're used in the database obviously. They're computed on demand. Um, they are the slower alternative of the two types. In other words, every time you run it, it scans the database, does what it needs to do, returns the data, bang. But it's all because of that, it's always up to date. It's always got what it needs. It's fantastic. On the other hand, there's something called materialized views. Materialized views are found in the data warehouses. So for what you, for if you guys don't know what a data warehouse is, a data warehouse is <coughs> a special kind of database, kind of database, where um, data is summarized. So Amazon, for example, when the sales reps come up, 
they don't query the actual Amazon store. They're going to query the data warehouse with the summarized data. Um, materialized views are pre-computed offline. That means that the data is computed once and stored. That means the, the searches are faster at runtime because it doesn't need to do the joins, it doesn't need to do the where's. It's literally like a flat table with rows and columns in it, and that's all that's in it. Uh, the problem with that, though, is it can have stale data. So if the materialized view is set to reset every night at midnight, it will not contain any of the data from that day until the next refresh. So as the database refreshes the sales data, then the materialized views will um, update. But until they've refreshed, it only has whatever existed when it was created. You can picture it as in, um, anybody here work with spreadsheets? Work in an office where spreadsheets were a thing, common thing? Uh, no. Anybody here ever work with an accountant? No. Oh, wow. Okay. That makes me feel even older. No. So, for example, accountants love print printing spreadsheets. So let's say they had a spreadsheet. They had all the data up to date. They print the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet's on a piece of paper. He can give that spreadsheet. Everybody can look at the spreadsheet based on the numbers when that piece of paper was printed. If somebody wants more up-to-date information to look at, he'd print the spreadsheet again with more updated information, which now the old piece is stale. It's disposed of. The new one's the one they would go to. It's the same idea. The, the materialized view is very fast to run because it's already there. If they, like, uh, back to my accountant, he printed out the piece of paper and somebody says, oh, I need to see the sales numbers for the last week. And he just hands them a stack of papers because he doesn't need to go open up the spreadsheet, go find the right spot, then give them the numbers. You can just give them the piece of paper and say, there you go. Same idea. So updating views. So this is an interesting slide. Um, because honestly, I strongly recommend you don't create updatable views putting it out there um, because they're kind of dangerous and unreliable. So, but that having been said, how can you insert a record or a tuple into a table that doesn't exist because a view is a virtual table. It doesn't exist. Um, so the, the answer is you have to include all the primary keys for every table that's in the view. So if you do select this view, select name project from employee with departments equal to development, and you go insert into developers, Joe and optimizer, it'll turn into some, the, the following insert statement. So if you look, this employee table has a social security number, name, department, project, and salary. And if you do the insert against the view, it'll only populate the columns that exist in the view, which means that the SSN, the department, and the salary would not get populated at insertion time. And because this is a really stupid database, the SSN is the primary key. Social security number is the primary key. So you're going to try to add something without a primary key. What's going to happen? It'll say no. It'll tell you in uncertain terms that you suck, that you shouldn't try to do this. So what you would need to do is you would need to include the social security number as part of this query. And suddenly now we're leaking information to the to the employees that aren't supposed to be leaked. Therefore, don't insert against views. Um, now, when I say updating views in MySQL, this doesn't mean updating data through the view. This is talking about updating your view, like the views you've created. Um, so there's a couple of different ways of doing it. The first one changes the structure of the view. The second one would actually um, update the data in the view. Obviously, I just said don't do that, so don't update the data in the view. Um, so MySQL has this command called create or replace. So if it finds a view that has the same name, it will replace its definition. However, create or replace has one big limitation. The number of columns being returned by the view must be the same. If your original view is select name, comma, department from employees, 
And then you want to replace it with select name department salary from employees. You won't be able to do a create or replace because the number of columns is different. So how do you update your view? You drop the original one and recreate it. So create or replace view is really handy when you need to update the where clause, maybe add a join to make the where clause more precise, that kind of thing. Um, but if you are changing the actual definition of what's being returned, you have to drop it and recreate it. And that's pretty much every database engine, not just MySQL. Um, so this is back to talking about trying to create a view that can be updated. It's not updatable. There is a link on this slide. So if you really want to figure out how to create an updatable view in MySQL, go read it. It's not going to be on any test. I will not ask you the specifics on how to create it because I'm just telling you don't do it anyways because you're just going to leak information that this shouldn't be part of the view. And if you want to get rid of a view, drop view, whatever it's called, you can use if exists in it to make sure that if the view doesn't exist already, it doesn't give you an error. It just goes, drop it if it exists. If it doesn't, just carry on. And that's it. So those are views. It's really not a complicated concept. It's basically treat it as a bookmark that you give it a name. <coughs> um, so that being said, this brings us to literally the end of first half of the term. Okay. Next week will be a quick review. I will give you better details on what, what, how the test, what's going to be on the test, like how many questions and that kind of thing. Um, I will also do a um, start to end demo on the board of starting from normalization all the way to a physical diagram, right? Start to end. It's not going to be a complicated design. But it's literally going to be from start to end, an entire design. So I'll put up some uh, unnormalized, unnormalized, do you know, I'll put on unnormalized data. I'll normalize it first, second, third normal form, create an ERD from it, convert that to a physical diagram, assign the data types. The whole process will be done on the board next week. So you guys can have a all encompassing view of how that's done. Um, I found historically that tends to be, you know, a pretty useful thing for me to show everybody. Uh, something a lot of database profs don't do, which I always found kind of strange. Um, and the week after that is your midterm test. Usually it's an hour. So here for the first hour, write the test. Then I see you guys two weeks later, <laughs> almost. And uh, yeah, so that's the end of today. Uh, does anybody have any last minute questions before we break for lab? Well, break for, so I can go to a lab and then see the other people in the other lab. Okay. Um, I can do that really, really quick. Um, for lab five, which is all about creating views and stuff. So for what you guys are going to do for that lab, because I, you click on your connection. If you're on Windows or Mac, this may look slightly different. And you'll get a query window. In your schema, you will go to whatever database it happens to be. In this case, I have a different database than you guys in here. Um, and you basically, you double click on the database that you want. Uh, for that lab, I believe it's the world database, which you should have brought in in lab one. You double click on it. You write your query, and you run your query. That's my SQL workbench in 30 seconds or less. Yeah, that's really all there is. For lab five, that's the only technique you need to know is you can you launch it, you connect, you pick your right database, you type in your SQL commands. So in data grip, you guys would launch data grip, 
click on your database, type in your command. Same thing, just different engine, different interface. Um, the only reason we're using MySQL Workbench is for the stuff that happens after the break. Uh, when we cover uh, doing backups, creating users, managing users. Um, Data Grip is really good. Data Grip's really painful to do that work with. So better off using the native tools to do the job. The and then the last half, you could, we could, you guys could actually do this with data grip if you wanted. If you're more comfortable in data grip, I don't care. MySQL Workbench is fine, data grip is fine, I don't care. You'll need it for labs uh, six and seven. Maybe eight, off the top of my head. So that's it. Launch, connect, pick your database, run your commands. That's it, that's all folks. All right, any other questions? Going once, going twice, going three times.